Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, projective arithmetic function encryption. And we will see how to use this to construct IO from degree five multilinear maps. Okay, so let, in this work, we're going to focus on constructing IO. Um, so all the current known constructions of IO are based on multilinear maps. So multilinear maps are essentially generalizations of bilinear maps. Uh, while bilinear maps allows you to uh, compute quadratic functions in the exponents of the group, uh, multilinear maps allows you to uh, compute higher degree polynomials in the exponents of the group. Okay, uh, and in particular, we define degree D multilinear maps to be one where you can compute uh, degree D polynomials in the exponents of the group. Yeah. So the natural question to ask is, what is the minimum degree of multilinear maps that you require to construct IO? So the ideal goal would be two, right? So then we can just base I/O on bilinear maps. However, the original constructions, uh, starting with Gurg et al., uh, built I/O from polynomial degree multilinear maps. In last Eurocrypt, uh, a very nice construction by Lin showed how to construct I/O from constant degree multilinear maps. Uh, however, this constant was uh, was large. Subsequently, uh, work by Lin and Michael Tonathan showed how to achieve IO from 32 degree multilinear maps. And in this work, we reduce this degree further and we show how to construct IO from degree five multilinear maps. And on route, we show, we give a new template to construct IO from constant degree multilinear maps. And we hope that uh, this template might be useful to reduce the degree further. Uh, so in order to show what is this template, let us revisit the template of Lin and Vaikodanathan. Uh, so they show how to construct IO from constant degree multilinear maps by going through collision resistant function encryption for Boolean circuits. So in order to construct collision resistant function encryption for Boolean circuits, uh, you need to first start with M maps, which natively performs computations on elements of large fields. So in order to construct FE for Boolean circuits, the first step would be to sort of arithmetize this Boolean circuit into an arithmetic circuit, and then perform MMAP computations over this arithmetic circuit. So this arithmetization step could potentially increase the degree of the Boolean circuit you start with. So in order to overcome this, we introduce this new template where we, uh, we uh, introduce a notion of FE for arithmetic circuits, and we show how to construct IO from FE for arithmetic circuits, and then we show how to achieve this notion from constant degree multilinear maps. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, PAFE would be a version of function encryption for arithmetic circuits. Okay. Okay. So let me talk about our template in more detail. So we start with degree D multilinear maps, and then we construct PAFE for degree D polynomials. So the D in uh, D here is the same in this transformation. And then we show how to construct a sublinear secret KFE for uh, arbitrary polynomial size circuits, starting from PAFE for degree D polynomials and degree D randomizing polynomials. Again, here the D is the same. And then using prior works, we can get IO from sublinear secret KFE for uh, all P. So we just have to achieve the first and the second step. The, the third step is achieved by prior works. So when you instantiate the randomizing polynomials with degree five randomizing polynomials, uh, you get IO from degree five multilinear maps. And uh, the existence of uh, degree five randomizing polynomials is based on degree five uh, pseudo random generators with polynomial stretch. Concurrently, uh, Lin showed how to build IO assuming joint a 60H on degree five multilinear maps. Okay, so let me uh, describe the technical details. So let me first start by uh, defining the notion of projective arithmetic FE. Okay. So as I said, uh, we need to define a version of FE for arithmetic circuits. Uh, so the most brain dead attempt would be to just take FE for Boolean circuits, but instead of associating functional keys for Boolean circuits, now associate them with arithmetic circuits. Okay. So what is the problem with defining such a notion? 
the problem is that we don't know how to achieve this. And, the, and current techniques are, seem to be a limiting factor to achieve uh, such a strong notion. Then more particularly, if the output of the uh, arithmetic circuits, or you can also view it as a polynomial, is large, then uh, we don't know how to construct this. So to give more intuition, uh, if you look at uh, FE schemes for inner products, which are based on bilinear maps, the way decryption would work is, uh, in the end, you, the output of the computation is available as the exponent of a group. And you recover this output by performing discrete log. And you can only do discrete log if this output is small. OK, so let, let's define the notion of uh, uh, PAFE, which sort of uh, uh, circumvents this obstacle. So the basic syntax is similar to the FE scheme, except that we have uh, what we call projective decrypt algorithm. Uh, just as in FE scheme, there is an encryption and a key generation algorithm. However, the decryption of the functional key on the ciphertext is performed using a projective decrypt algorithm. That does not give you the output in the clear. But instead, it gives you an encoding of the output. And if you have many, many such encodings, you can execute uh, a recover algorithm that takes as input a linear function, as well as many of these encodings. And it outputs a linear function of all these elements in the clear, as long as this output is small. Okay. Okay. So this is the this is the notion. As I said, the notion is similar to FE scheme, except that uh, in in FE scheme, the output of the decryption gives you the result in the clear. However, here it's an, an encoding. And later on, you can manipulate these encodings to recover a uh, result in the clear. Okay. okay, so there are two prop main properties associated with the scheme. I'm not going to talk about correctness. Um, so apart from correctness, there is an efficiency property that says that uh, the size of the encryption should be a multiplicative overhead in the size of the message. And the multiplicative factor is polynomial in the security parameter and the degree d. Uh, for this work, d will be constant, so you can just ignore the multiplicative factor. And for security, we are going to define what we call semi-functional security. Uh, I won't have time to go into details. Uh, so this security notion is inspired by uh, the, the semi-functional security notions defined for AB. And uh, in in the context of AB, it was introduced to capture adaptive security. However, uh, in this work, we define this to achieve a weak form of function hiding that lets us uh, uh, prove things more easily. Okay. Okay. So now we define PAFE. So let's see how to construct sublinear secret KFE uh, from PAFE for degree D polynomials and uh, uh, degree D randomizing polynomials. OK, so uh, Ilan gave a very nice definition of FE. So let me just define the sublinear, sublinearity property that we need to place on the, on the FE scheme. Okay. So the sublinearity property just says that uh, the time to encrypt a message x should be sublinear in the circuit size. Okay. Time some polynomial in the security parameter and the message length. So the other tool which I didn't define was randomizing polynomials. Uh, if you're familiar with randomized encodings, it's ex essentially the same, except that uh, the encoding algorithm is associated with polynomials. Okay. So the encode algorithm takes as input a circuit C, and uh, it breaks it into many polynomials P1 to Pn. And on input x uh, and a random string r, you can essentially evaluate the polynomial p1 to pn on x comma r, and the result is the randomizing polynomial of c comma x. Okay. And then there is a decode algorithm that takes as input the output of all these polynomials, and it outputs c of x. 
And we define degree D randomizing polynomial to be one if all the polynomials uh, are of degree at most D. Okay. okay, so uh, let's see how to construct sublinear FE. So let me give the key generation algorithm. Uh, you can figure out the setup algorithm from this. Okay. So we have to generate a key for circuit C. First, execute the randomizing uh, polynomial encoding scheme on C to get polynomials P1 to Pn. And then generate PAFE keys for each one of these polynomials. And, uh, and then the functional key corresponding to C will be the collection of all these PAFE functional keys. Okay. This is the key generation algorithm. So the encryption algorithm takes as input x and picks a random string r and then executes a PAFE encryption of x comma r. Okay. Okay. And uh, how do you perform before we talk about decryption? So one thing here is that we want the size of the random string to be small, right? Because uh, we are constructing sublinear FE. Uh, and uh, we require that the ciphertext is sublinear in the circuit length. And so if the random string was as large as the size of the circuit, then the sublinearity property is destroyed. So in order to uh, achieve this property, we are going to place the constraint on the randomizing polynomial scheme that the randomness is sublinear in the circuit size. Okay. okay. So uh, the decryption is straightforward. So you have all these PAFE functional keys, uh, and you have the PAFE ciphertext. You just execute the projective decrypt algorithm to get uh, the encodings of the output of the polynomials. And then you execute the recover algorithm to obtain the randomized encoding of C comma X in the clear. And then you execute the decoding procedure of the randomizing polynomial scheme to get the answer. Okay. So with this, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the security. Uh, uh, that, that can be, uh, you can reduce the security of the sublinear FE scheme on the semi-functional security of the PFE scheme and the security of uh, randomizing polynomial scheme. Okay, so let's see how to instantiate uh, the randomizing polynomials using uh, degree five randomizing polynomials. So the first attempt would be to take a degree three randomizing polynomials polynomial scheme, and uh, note that this scheme does not have the sublinearity property. In particular, the size of the random string would be proportional to the circuit size. A trivial approach to compress randomness is just to use PRGs. Right? And we want to use low degree PRGs, uh, and uh, so we are going to use degree five PRGs that uh, achieves polynomial uh, stretch. And now, if you plug in the PRGs in the randomizing polynomial scheme, you will end up with the new randomizing polynomial scheme that achieves the sublinearity property and now has degree 15. Okay. And uh, the question is, how do we get these degree 5 PRGs? There is a Goldrick PRG candidate, uh, which, can be, which, is, which was proposed in the Boolean setting, but again, we can convert that into uh, in the in the arithmetic set setting and uh, uh, in the boolean setting the degree is two and when you construct it into uh, it constructed uh, consider this notion in the arithmetic set setting then the degree becomes five okay? and the security of this candidate was uh, analyzed by Ryan O'Donnell and uh, Whitmer in 2014. And in order to reduce the degree further from 15 to 5, uh, we use uh, some preprocessing trick that I won't have uh, time to go into detail. Uh, so in this trick, we essentially pre-compute some partial terms in the polynomials as part of the encryption itself. And the degree of the new randomizing polynomial would be degree 5 in all the pre-computed terms. Okay, so let me explain the last step where we have to get PAFE for degree D polynomials from degree D multilinear maps. 
Okay, so in order to do this, let me define an abstract notion that we call slotted encodings. Uh, so this is an abstraction of composite order multilinear maps. Uh, as in composite order multilinear maps, we encode a vector as against just one element. So suppose, let's say, you have a vector A, B, C. Uh, you encode A, B, C uh, with respect to some color. Uh, for instance, here it's orange. And now we can perform some operations such as addition and multiplication on these encodings. So if you want to perform addition, then you need to consider encodings of the same color. Uh, suppose, let's say, you have encoding A1, B1, C1, uh, and A2, B2, C2 with respect to the same color. And then you can add both of them uh, to get a new encoding A1 plus A2, B1 plus B2, and C1 plus C2. So we're essentially performing component-wise addition. And the multiplication is performed on encodings with respect to some compatible colors. Uh, what pair of colors are compatible is sort of dictated by the rules associated with the scheme. Okay. So suppose, let's say, you have encoding A1, B1, C1, and A2, B2, C2 then uh, finally you'll get an encoding corresponding to A1, A2, B1, B2, and C1, C2. So even for multiplication, uh, even multiplication is performed uh, component-wise. Okay. And finally, there's a zero-test operation that is performed for on encodings with respect to color red. So suppose, let's say, you have encoding A, B, C, and uh, you say that this encoding is zero if uh, A plus B plus C is zero. So this last step is where it sort of is different from composite order multilinear maps. So in the case of composite order M maps, uh, you output zero if all of them are zero. Okay. So we show that we can actually construct uh, slotted encodings from uh, degree D prime order multilinear maps. Uh, we define degree D slotted encodings to be one where uh, where it allows for evaluating polynomials of degree at most d in the exponents of the group. Okay. So let me start with the simple case of degree two, which is bilinear maps. So we want to encode a1, b1, c1, and a2, b2, c2. And uh, what we are going to do is we are going to pick vectors u1, u2, u3, and v1, v2, v3. And then we are going to uh, encode the vector a1 u1 plus b1 u2 plus c1 u3. So this is not just one encoding, it's a vector of encodings. And then you also encode a2 v1 plus b2 v2 plus c2 v3. Um, and these vectors are chosen in such a way that the, if you consider the inner product of ui and vj, then it is one if and only if i is equal to j. Otherwise, the inner product is zero. And if you're familiar with bilinear maps literature, you'll notice that this is essentially the notion of dual vector spaces. And indeed, such a transformation was already given in the bilinear maps literature. So how is this formulation useful? So if you just compute an inner product of these two encodings, you will end up with an encoding of A1, A2 plus B1, B2 plus C1, C2. So this allows for this, this sort of uh, uh, mechanism allows for component-wise multiplication. So in order to do for constant, uh, for higher degrees, uh, we can only do this transformation for constant degree. Uh, we can, we'll consider a tensoring of dual vector spaces. Uh, so for this talk, I'm just going to focus on degree three. So uh, as before, you pick vectors u1, u2, u3, and b1, b2, v3. Additionally, you also pick vectors w1, w2, and w3. So the vector corresponding to w will be associated with the next level. So at the base level, you will use vectors u's and v's. Okay. So on the left-hand side, you will encode a1, b1, c1 using uh, a tensoring of uh, w vectors and v ve u vectors. Okay. On the right-hand side, you will encode just using v vectors. So now if you consider an inner product of these two vectors, you will end up with a1, a2, w1 plus b1, b2, w2 plus c1, c2, w3. 
So this again, the component-wise multiplication is still going on. But now note that you also have these vectors, w1, w2, and w3 remaining. And this can be used for the next level computation. So you can sort of generalize this idea uh, for constant degrees. Okay, okay so now let's uh, focus on constructing PAFE from slotted encodings. Okay, so uh, let me start with the setup algorithm. Here you're going to pick uh, random values R1 to Rn. And where n here is the length of the message that you're encrypting. So in order to encrypt a message x, you are going to encrypt xi, ri, and 0 using the slotted encoding scheme uh, for every bit of x. Okay. And all these encodings will now form the ciphertext. So in order to now generate a key for a polynomial p, you are going to evaluate the polynomial p on r1 to rn that was picked uh, in the setup. And then you're going to encode 0, comma p of r1 to rn and 0. So the functional key will be p, comma this encoding. So how would you decrypt? So now you have uh, the polynomial p and all these uh, encodings as part of the ciphertext, right? So you homomorphically evaluate uh, these encodings using the polynomial p. So you'll end up uh, with p of x1 to xn in the first slot, and p of r1 to rn in the second slot, and 0 in the third slot. Right? And you can cancel the second slot, which has p of r1 to rn, using the encoding as part of the functional key. Right? And then you'll end up with p of x1 to xn in the first slot, and 0 and 0 in the second and third slots. From which, if p of x1 to xn is small, you can recover this. The question is, why is this secure? This is secure because uh, uh, the p of r1 to rn in the second slot sort of forces uh, the evaluator to use the polynomial p in the homomorphic evaluation algorithm. Uh, however, there are still some attacks that I did not take into consideration, which are these mix and match attacks. I could potentially take some encodings from one ciphertext and combine them with uh, some encodings from another ciphertext. And uh, in the end, I can still evaluate and cancel out this, uh, the element in the second slot. And in order to prevent this, these sort of attacks, we use ciphertext-specific checks. So note that this, uh, the check p of r1 to rn is uh, independent of the ciphertext. I mean, it, it can be used for any ciphertext. So by somehow interacting the key and the ciphertext, if we can create some ciphertext-specific checks, we can prevent such attacks. Okay. And we have mechanisms in our paper to deal with this, uh, and I, I don't want to go into details. Okay, okay with this, I conclude. Uh, so in this work, we give a new template to get I/O from degree five multilinear maps. Uh, Lin and Tesoro showed how to get I/O from degree three multilinear maps, uh, and uh, in particular, they define the notion of blockwise local PRGs, uh, and they show they give a degree-preserving transformation to go from uh, blockwise local PRGs to I/O. Uh, one question to explore is: Can we what, are the, what is the right kind of definition of PRG that suffices to construct I.O.? And in particular, can we define a notion of degree two PRGs that suffices to get I.O.? Uh, and why do we focus on degree two? Because this would yield I.O. from bilinear maps. However, recently there have been some works that uh, have some negative results on uh, degree two PRGs. Um, again, for some definitions of uh, degree two PRGs. With this, I can say. Thank you. Any questions for Banjan? We have time for one quick question. So, Banjan, hi. Uh, hi. So, uh, nice talk. Um, um, do you, uh, when you say I/O from constant degree multiple fi degree five multilinear maps, yeah. what assumption do you need? Uh, so, in our SSD? work, we have a generic model proof, essentially. Ah, I yeah. see. It's not and based uh, on such assumption. I see. And um, the improvement of uh, Rachel, it needs uh, SXDH or yes. joint SXDH? Joint SXDH, sure. 
Ah, okay. 